afternoon. My name is Johan. I'm one of the ministers at Community Congregational Church. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you uh, at our church. It is with mixed feelings that I welcome you as we are here to say goodbye, but also to celebrate his life, but say goodbye to someone who together with his wife and family had been pillars of our church community. It is very nice to have you here and I appreciate your patience. As you know, Caroline has a slight Sunday morning job that she had to take care of uh, to make it here. I appreciate your patience in waiting. Uh, Nan is unable to join us for the event and for her benefit we are video recording the service for her so that she would be a part uh, of it that way. Elements of our service are not announced. Please follow along in the brochure that you have. All the hymns and everything are right there. And also we would like to make sure that upon closing you take a moment to sign the guest book which is right at the door on your left hand side. Uh, the family would love to know of your presence here and please make sure that you sign the guest book so that they know that you are here with them. At this time I ask you to please stand with me as we join together in a responsive greeting. We gather here in the protective shelter of God's healing love. We gather here as God's people, conscious of He who has died and of the frailty of our own existence on earth. We come to comfort and to support one another in our common loss. We gather to hear God's word of hope that can drive away our despair and move us to offer God our praise. We gather to commend to God with thanksgiving the life of Ed Berninger as we celebrate the good news of Christ's resurrection. For whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Christ, who is Lord both of the dead undone, 
things that we leave unsaid, or things that we have done, things that we have said. We may remember, dear God, the gifts, the love, and the times that we may have taken for granted, not just with He who has passed, but also with other loved ones, times that may have come to an end. We are reminded, dear God, of the reciprocation that we may not have shown and our opportunities were missed, and often intentions and promises were forgotten or broken. So dear God, I pray that in your great mercy you forgive us, that you comfort us, and that you move us towards healing so that our spirits and our guilt can be lifted, our regret, so that we can walk in the freedom and in the peace that you intend for us. I pray that through your grace you open us up at this time at this moment of tribute, ever still a time of worship, so that as we have come face to face with the mystery of death, we are able to see the light of eternity, the potential and the opportunity that we still have to show love, to show appreciation, support to those whom we still have with us in our lives. I pray, dear God, that through your Holy Spirit you speak to us once more your solemn message of love and of life eternal, that you enable us to live so that whether we live or whether we die, our very life and existence may be in your Son, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. <coughs>
walk by faith, not by sight. Those bonds 
of those of you here today are what has made it all bearable. And thank you. I don't think I can tell you anything essential that you don't already know or that would surprise you about Daddy. And that, I think, can be chalked up to his character. He was who he was, who he was, always. And who he was was a smart, kind, amusing, helpful, organized kind of a guy. And I think he really did recognize that in the words of Psalm 16, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. He appreciated the people, the places, the situations he found himself with. And that goes back, I think, to his very earliest childhood. Years ago, I came across a letter he wrote to his Aunt Caroline when he was eight or nine and stuck at home with some childhood illness. And he related to her how he had amused himself by reading Tom Swift books. And then went on to say how many pages were in each book and an average of how many words per page. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. But vintage Eddie. He really did make the most of every situation. A Phi Kappa Sigma brother of his, Howie Larson, called last night to relate a fraternity initiation uh, incident, I think it was. Um, maybe others can uh, verify this, um, involving carrying one of the pledges in a cage across the Harvard Bridge. Eddie was the one picked to be in the cage, perhaps <laughs> because he was slight, slight of stature. Um, but apparently, from what Mr. Larson related, he did not go quiet. He made the most of this stunt, yelling at the top of his lungs and reaching out of the cage to try to pound on the cars on the bridge. I never knew about that. So, uh, but it, it all doesn't surprise me because he did make the most of his situations. Many of you will remember the old dart and the even older valiant that he actually had the temerity to drive in short hills. Uh, mommy at least had some sense of keeping up appearances. Every year or so, she would go to Walgreens and get a can of white spray paint and send them out in the driveway to spray over the rust. Stuff like that just didn't get to him, despite his fastidious attention to detail in other ways of his living. There is a family portrait from the early 70s out, out there in one of the photo boards that Mann put together that you should take a look at. It's very early 70s, but that picture almost didn't come out looking civilized. I have a vivid memory of the photographer who came to our house saying very delicately before the picture, Mr. Berninger, were you planning to wear those shoes? <laughs> and Mommy going, boom, oh, hey, no. And my father said, well, I didn't know my feet would be in the He just <laughs> stuffed his feet back in the shoes, he, the ratty sneakers he'd been doing yard work in um, before his shower, you know. And uh, just didn't, didn't really matter to him. I think one of the things that made him so secure was having been surrounded from birth by people who adored him. And I think that shaped who he was. He did not become a spoiled brat. He became a man who was never upset by anything, except, except perhaps the sight or the thought of children suffering, subjected to trauma that he didn't think any child should endure. He would be moved to tears by the pictures of children 
after September 11th at their firefighter father funerals. And pictures of children who were lost in the Holocaust or of Armenian children orphaned in the genocide alike would move him to tears. And I think he would have been put over the edge by the recent photo of Amran Dagnish, the wounded Syrian child. And that tenderness in him, I think, allowed him to reach out in love to the rest of us. I thank you for being some of those who have been part of the love that surrounded him, one of the great congregation who had made him who he was. Thank you for that grace. Pass it on. <clears throat> I'm uh, Bahe Kirchian. Uh, it's son-in-law. That means I'm married to her. <laughs> um, I think I know what I'm going to say. Uh, I hope it doesn't sound awfully repetitive about what a wonderful guy it was, because I guess we could keep on talking about that. Um, so my parents and Caroline's parents never met. And so once in a while, you know, Caroline will say, so what, what do you think your parents would have thought of my parents? And I think the shorter answer is, well, they would have gone along famously. You know, who wouldn't get along famously with Ed and Carol? But I think they would have perceived that Ed was a lucky guy. In the sense that we casually think about luck and in other more um, subtle senses. You know, if you think about it, he was born into the Depression in the hard coal country of Pennsylvania, as you like to put it but to a solidly middle-class family. He did not have a dust bowl depression. Uh, he happened to live up the road from a very fine private school where he and his beloved sister, with whom he had a mutual admiration society their entire lives, went to school there. From there, he went to a passable trade school in Boston, MIT. <laughs> and uh, on the ROTC scholarship, which just after World War II, is what everybody did. And in fact, as a further example of his luck, his firm intention when he was in high school was to join the submarine service. And fortunately for him, he got out of high school after 1945, to the great relief of his parents. And so, after MIT, he worked for a little bit, and then got called up to serve in the Korean War. And then instead of getting thrown into the meat grinder, of the Chinese counterattack, he was sent to the Special Weapons Unit, which is the Army's not very deceptive alias for their nuclear weapons program. And in a rare instance of the wisdom of the Army, he didn't stay very long in the Special Weapons Unit. They made him a mess officer, clean Army base in Fort Sam Houston, Texas, across the street from Fort Hood, which was fine with it because he did not want to make bigger and more horrible nuclear weapons. He wanted to see people having a good meal. And this job suited him perfectly. And the first time I ever met Ed was um, at the inn at Lake Warrenbog in Connecticut. I had no inkling that he would be my father-in-law. Caroline had invited me, I guess for ulterior motives, to this sort of little family gathering. Um, and it was very clear that Ed was in his element presiding over a convivial experience. And after he got a, while he was in the army, on a blind date, he met his wife, who was a perfect companion for him for many, many years, over 50. And after he got out of the army, he dove into the sweet spot of American corporate employment, which we will never see again. And he rode that wave all the way to a propitious early retirement. Um, due to a, a medical condition that proved to be more of a nuisance than a nemesis, happily. But he just grabbed retirement by the throat and lived the swinging, so snowbird life kind of between Short Hills and Sanibel, Florida, where they had their summer, their Florida house. And 
he was my hero. I was planning to follow in his footsteps as soon as I possibly could, mm -hmm. which hasn't worked out yet, but that's still my goal. And um, he had two daughters he loved, and he had uh, colleagues who loved being with him and friends and neighbors who loved being with him. And uh, he ended up in a retirement community at the end of his life, which I think added at least a year to his life because of the care he got there as a still um, active kind of guy. But that's all a lucky life. But you know, luck is not just an accumulation of random events with positive outcomes. When Napoleon was considering an officer for promotion to general ranks, he didn't ask very much about it the guy's service record. He asked, is he doing Which kind of means, is he lucky? Lucky not just for himself, because what does it to you if the general is the only one who makes it off the battlefield, but is he lucky for everybody else? And heureux in French means not only lucky, but also felicitous, happy, blessed, capable and particularly capable of getting out of a tight spot, of bringing things home to their right conclusion. And luck is a talent among those who have one. It's not an accident. Lucky people are talented at being lucky. And if Ed Berninger was given a thing to do, that thing would come out well. And it would come out well, not just for him, but for everybody involved. Because that was the right thing to do. I went and planned my wedding, because it was very obvious, you know, except from stipulating where we would get married. Uh, it was obvious he was going to do a much better job than I would. And some of you were at the wedding, and, you know, I would do it again. I would do it again every year if I could. It was a great time. And when it talked about his life and told the stories of his life, but I think most of us have heard most of them, sometimes 20 or 30 times. <laughs> the stories were never about him and his wonderful exploits. They were about the other wonderful people that he was with. And if he ever entered these stories in as a protagonist, it was for the purpose of poking fun at himself. When he was uh, the mess officer at Clean Army Base for his battalion, he uh, had to go on, he was taking some leave, and so he got one of the other junior officers to sub for him as mess officer. And this, this guy was a West Point graduate, regular army guy. So Ed was talking to um, Sergeant Shirota, Staff Sergeant Shirota, who was the guy who really ran in this, as anybody knows who is familiar with how the army works. It's the non coms who run the institution. So he was talking to Shirota about the uh, what this other lieutenant was going to do. And uh, so he said, so, uh, Sergeant Schroeder, you think, uh, think Lieutenant Porter will be okay? And so Schroeder said, well, sir, I've never met a West Pointer yet who was a good mess officer. They're too honest. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, what does that make me? <laughs> you know, as Caroline mentioned, Ed had a way of making himself at home and cozy and occupied no matter where he was. And, and I don't know that I've seen anybody who was as talented as he was at um, finding things to occupy him and putting them all together <coughs> in an orderly life. And I, you know, I think he became an engineer, I don't really think because he, he yearns to invent new things or was really driven to understand how everything worked. He liked order. This was a guy who had all of his paper clips sorted by size and all in the same direction. <laughs> and, and for a guy who was at the leading edge of uh, mainframe computer applications in the corporate world when he got it out of MIT, um, he had absolutely no interest in computers in his daily life. They were a solution in search of a problem, as far as he was concerned. He had his stamps. He had his wife, he had his life, he had Sanibel, he had here. He was very content. And, and he often, in that respect, reminded me of um, 
one of my favorite characters in literature. Crispin's Crispy, who is the protagonist of Margaret Weiss Brown's book, Mr. Dog, and also one of the only Armenian characters in American children's literature. And at one point she writes, Crispin's Crispian was a conservative. He liked everything at the right time. Dinner at dinner time, lunch at lunch time, breakfast in time for breakfast, sunset at sunset, sunrise at sunrise. And at bedtime, at bedtime, everything in its place. The cup and the saucer, the chair under the table, the stars in the heavens, the moon in the sky, and himself in his own little bed. And that was it. He had a beautiful world. As he got older, that world contracted, of course. His interests extended to shorter and shorter radiuses around his customary habits. And, and he would do some weird things. You, know, you gave him a book to read at your peril, because if you got it back, like a, all through the book, he would sort of tabulate the things that you could count on the pages, and then compare them to other things you'd be counting on the pages. And so one day he handed me a book back, and I said, Ed, hey, what were you thinking? And he said, well, as you know, I'm a creature of habit. <laughs> he was loved and loved. And that made a big difference. You know, when he was um, at Exxon, he served on this board that was supposed to review applications for promotion within the company. And of course, uh, you know, departmental directors would really, really jazz up their candidate, either because they firmly believed in their candidate, or they couldn't wait to get rid of them and get them promoted somewhere else. <laughs> and it happened that all of this, all the members in this committee, all the former men, this being the 70s, were all Boy Scouts. Ed, in fact, had been an Eagle Scout. And one day they were listening to somebody propose this candidate for promotion, a, a particularly steamy, loaded nonsense. And one of them just started asking, well, is he trustworthy, loyal, friendly, helpful? And one by one, all of the other Boy Scouts at the table chimed in, cheerful, obedient. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is the rest of the Boy Scouts. Uh, cheerful, obedient, um, right. kind, yeah. Uh, and finally, um, uh, you know, brave, thrifty, clean and reverent. And that became their MO as a committee. Every time somebody came up with, you know, with a BS job, they would start reciting the Boy Scout law and asking them to compare this guy to the Boy Scout law. And of course, not many people compare very well, and maybe most of us would not. But Ed Berninger did. Ed Berninger was a Boy Scout his whole life. As a boy, as a young man, as a husband, as a father, as an uncle, grandfather, brother, father-in-law, friend, neighbor, colleague. That was who Ed was. Trustworthy, loyal. Not always so clean, but certainly right. <laughs> and he was a lucky guy. It's always good to have a Boy Scout in your life especially a lucky Boy Scout. And I think Napoleon would have made him mess officer general. So, <laughs> thank you.
So it is the bane of every bright and eventful conversation. It is the cure for any boring dinner, the political and presidential election. If you wish to brighten up a conversation, if you wish to have people at each other's throats disagreeing, if you wish to have people in tremendous agreement, all you have to do is bring up the same topic, namely the presidential election. And there are many things that you will hear people say about it, not always knowing if they are ever revealing to you whom they would truly support in the end. And they may talk about who can be trusted and who cannot be trusted. They may talk about the importance of business acumen or the lack thereof, the importance of a track record or the lack thereof. But there is one thing that you will hear from both sides of the aisle, from both candidates, a lot. And that is the first person pronoun. I will deliver. I will restore. I will make America. I will fix. I will bring. I have heard. I can do. <clears throat> now some are saying that it is part of the job that you're supposed to, as a politician, sell yourself. I mean, what candidate has any wish to be elected to be or she is not going to tell people what he or she will do. So it's only logical that the person will embark on these first person pronouns all the time. Others are saying that it is part of the culture today where the individual is simply front and center. Where there is no more concern for the greater good as much as the manner in which each individual can craft and design and make and do whatever he or she wishes to do. Convention now is the unconventional. What was done before doesn't have to be done again. The way things worked before doesn't have to work that way anymore. And so people are saying that, listen, this is in the same progression as the taking of selfies and everyone sitting late at night, early in the morning, posting comments, informed, uninformed. And that is just part of the reality. That is our world today. As is this culture of bravado. Where a half a tackle on the football field sparks a celebration that looks like it might go on for minutes. Where people are in the habit of giving trophies to everyone who appears on the field. Where at the end of the Little League game, the Pee Wee football game, or the soccer game, everyone is told high five, good game, good kick, good job, good effort. When the weather or not it was. If these are the things that are requirements for the Oval Office to be able to flaunt your gifts and your talents, talk with bravado and confidence and put yourself first, Ed Berninger would never stand a chance to get elected. We are mourning today the passing of a man who was unassuming how many unassuming people do you know who can contribute, who could fix, who could restore, who could bring, but they remain unassuming? How many people do you know who can tamp down their bravado and remain gentle and patient and hang back and make people around them develop ideas as opposed to just barging in and telling everybody what he or she would do? How many people do you know like that? How many people do you know that has a wicked sense of humor? Where would we be in this world without a sense of humor? There's not a lot of sense of humor going around in the presidential election. You see, the passage from Ecclesiastes, yes, it is written thousands of years ago. And yes, people have different opinions today about this book, the Bible. Many will believe that it is outdated. But let me tell you, it talks about archetypes, it talks about the basic aspects of human behavior. When a passage is read about the cyclical nature about life, it is speaking the truth, which transcends time. And such structure, about an appropriate place and appropriate way, we saw in a person like it. How many people do you know that know appropriateness and timing in this matter? 
Let me tell you, as a Christian, those are ways in which we learn about God. For God is revealed from the pages of the book, the Bible. God is revealed to us as God's light is reflected to us through people like that, that show these traces of godliness, like appropriateness. Like the sense of structure to understand that, yes, there is a time for everything and there is order to it. But you know that at the end of the day, we can be content because we can sit back and enjoy the gifts that we do have. How many people do you know that get so fixated on a problem that they forget everything else? And the good life that all of us live in these here United States. Because we lose sight of the bigger picture. And are not content to eat and drink and be with friends and be merry and be happy. How many people do you know that have that sense of purpose? To be confident but not arrogant like Ed. And such is the confidence we can get from God when we understand that what defines us are not the things that we see, but that we don't walk by what we see. We walk by what we believe, and that there is a place prepared, and there is a place to go to. Can you understand how it is possible for a child of God like Ed Berninger to be confident and comfortable in his own skin? Because in his essence, he was at peace with what he was and whose he was and where he was going. So the burden to you, the family, and the friends of a man like Ed, <coughs> is to pay tribute to a man today who set a high bar for being skilled and talented, but unassuming and confident, and clear about structure, content with life, and understanding of where it goes. These are lofty things. They require a sense of wisdom and a sense of humility. So if you wish to pay tribute to it, let it go beyond writing your name in the book as we want for you to do. Let it go beyond the sacrifices you made to drive here today, to be here. Let it go beyond the words that I hope you will offer to Caroline and the grandchildren. Let it go to your own life. And search for yourself the manner in which your life can have such traces of godliness. Ed did not have the monopoly on humility and contentment and focus and direction. These are things that spring to us from the pages of the Bible that are there for each and every one of us. Pay tribute to its legacy by taking up your responsibility, your map of shining light. So therefore, if all things concerned, I take back what I said. Ed would have made a great present. I ask that you now please stand, please turn to your bulletin. Please that you join with me responsibly in this statement of faith. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and in which we hold fast, that neither death nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Please pray with me. Merciful God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together to celebrate the life and the memory of a man who proved on so many levels to be an inspiration. I give thanks to your God that we also have from the pages of your holy book directions like a lamp to our feet, like a light to our path. I thank you, dear God, that in our grief and in our sorrow we are not left to nothing, we are not left to ourselves, but that we have the light of your promises to sustain us and to comfort us. I pray that through our morning you give us the vision to see in faith the consolation, the contentment that you intend for each and every one of us. Dear Lord, with 
faith in your great mercy and wisdom, we now entrust Ed Berninger to your eternal care. We praise you for your steadfast love for him all the days of his earthly life. We thank you for all that he was to those who loved him. We thank you for his faithful service to country, to the Church of Christ, and to the greater good. We thank you that for Ed all sickness and sorrow are ended, that death itself is past, and pray that he has entered the home where all your people gather in peace. I pray that you keep us all in communion with your faithful people in every time and place, in the confidence of a certain faith, in the comfort of a saving hope, in favor with you, our God, and at perfect peace with the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who taught us to pray, saying these words aloud, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I ask you to please stand with me for the final commendation. Holy God, by your mighty power you gave us life, and in your love you have given us new life in Jesus Christ. We now entrust it burning to your merciful care. We do this in the faith of Christ Jesus, who died and rose again to save us and is now alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit in glory forever. Amen.